I, I uh, did not bring my presentation. I'm not a professional speaker, so this is uh, new to me, but it's important. My name is uh, Dan Stonecipher, and for the last 30 plus years, I've been in the grease trap and oil um, collection and disposal business, and now recycling business. And uh, through that, I saw the need to start a little association called San Diego's Fats Oils and Grease Haulers Association. Uh, aimed at the haulers to try to get them to come together and curb some of uh, the activities that are going on in our industry. Uh, because it is a highly regulated industry, but it's not got a lot of enforcement. And so enforcement, I'm hoping, can come together through the haulers collectively uh, watching the industry. Because it, uh, part of the other industry that's being affected is grease trap collection. It's kind of going hand in hand with the waste oil collection. And some of the collectors are going around claiming to be able to service the grease traps while they're doing the waste vegetable oil. Well, grease traps is not really a high commodity. It's, it's more of a, a waste product. And it needs to be handled correctly properly or else it winds up becoming an environmental impact. Uh, it can wind up in storm drains, sewer lines, and places it doesn't need to be. So uh, in history, in the 35 years I've been in the business, I've seen a lot of things come and go. Uh, a lot of enzyme products, bacteria products claiming to get rid of the grease trap waste and treat the oil. Well, the oil has always been a commodity, but it's becoming a big commodity. Invention of biodiesel, not the invention, but the bringing it more current, the biodiesel industry. So we've seen a lot of thefts. Where a guy, a company like myself, has spent a lot of money to go out and buy a collection container, put it out. We have a contract with the restaurant, which is required by law that the collection service has got to have a contract with the restaurant legally. Thirty-six. Well, with that, we've uh, <coughs> been losing some of those contracts through the promise of high payment for the oil, promise of grease trap services for no charge, which brings to another problem is that grease trap waste and waste vegetable oil cannot be commingled. It's a different waste stream. So now I've got my presentation up here. Uh, Where do you want to go to? Let's start on six there. So once again, this is the worst that I've ever seen. I, I've had collection containers I put out with my restaurant customers, get out there, it's all gone. Sometimes even the containers will be gone. They'll be picked up. I go in and ask the restaurant manager, where's my container? Another company has picked it up or they just service it. Sometimes they claim they're part of my company uh, in order to pick up the material. Uh, it's, it's really, really gotten bad. So through the association I started, I started petitioning them on number eight. Can you skip seven? I just to, 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 to give you just some space for, for our perspective, we are one of the least aggressive collectors in the area. They don't agree with that. We have a couple of hundred accounts in sort of from San Diego, all the way to LA, San Bernardino. But we suffer in the restaurant business about 40% theft, unlicensed folks who are picking up oil. And I'm not talking about homebrewers who go to their little accounts, they've got like three or four restaurants. I'm talking about this is like thousands of gallons of product that we have every month. It, it's um, gone. Yeah. You're, you're expecting to collect it, you set your containers out expecting to go there. I have complaints every day. There's smaller companies in San Diego that have been around for 40, 50 years collecting just oil, making a living. Association and saying, where's my oil? Somebody had just come in, cut all the locks, and stole the oil. Well, when they call the police to complain, file a report, nobody knows anything about it. It's not a, it's not a theft. 
Well, through our association, we have petitioned the local district attorney's office. I've been to Sacramento to talk to the agencies that are supposed to be enforcing that. And I can't break the laws. I can't go out and steal oil. I'm not going to do it. I won't have any part of it. Got to do something for us. So we petitioned them to uh, do more enforcement. So. <clears throat> The IKG is governed by a lot of laws. Uh, the EPA has got their hand in it. Uh, they're not very active with enforcement right now because nobody's complaining about it. Or at least the complaints are falling on deaf ears. Uh, <clears throat> Our little mission statement is a Go Green nonprofit organization dedicated to the environmentally safe hauling, collection, and disposal practices that are being followed by the legitimate hauler and the fog generators, which is the restaurant. So through communication, cooperation, we're hoping to get some more attention brought to this problem. And uh, <clears throat> the current laws, some of them are being overlooked or for whatever reason not followed. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. I'm sorry, I'm not used to looking at a presentation and talking. <clears throat> I could talk, but I can't follow a presentation very well. <laughs> the enforcement has been a little slow in coming, but like I said, I've petitioned a lot of local agencies, the district attorney's office, to do something. Um, and just recently, uh, Bonnie DeBonis, our district attorney, has talked about it on television, said that they've worked resources to put a stop to it. Uh, they're stepping up the efforts. So what we're doing is hoping that... Yeah. So I, I should have more of a comment. I want to set the stage here. You can imagine that a lot of this stuff is happening early in the morning. Again, I was trying to make this thing between folks who are going and maybe they're making some fuel in their houses. And so they go to a restaurant, they know, they, they, they get the cubies, like five-gallon cubies, okay? Now, actually, there is a regulation about that. But we have people who go around, they get at 3 in the morning, and they literally have these little back trucks or totes with with Harbor Freight vacuum pumps. And you know who's doing something legitimate at three in the morning, mm -hmm. sucking all this oil out, yeah. right? It's not like you went to the restaurant over and said, oh, you know, I'm making some body soap and I have your cubies. Okay, it's informal. It's actually contrary to the law, but you know, it's, it's in the daytime. These are people who go out late at night and they are just stealing oil. They know what they're doing and they're gonna try to sell it into the market. So it's a real problem for us. I, well, I, that sort of is a question. Somebody who's not in the business, but I'm curious about this. Uh, somebody steals a car, they're going to sell a car to somebody or they're going to strip it for parts at a place where it can be staked out. What do you do with waste oil that you're stolen if it isn't going to a central collection point, but people that you sell it to? That's one of the issues is somebody is buying the, the waste material. Somebody is either buying it out of ignorance or complete lack of respect for the law. Yeah. It's not like there's a dispersed market. It's a market going, a, a, a centralizing market. You know, a dispersed market for car parts, a dispersed market for used cars. Where's the dispersed market for waste of oil? Biodiesel manufacturers are looking for it. They're, they're, they're buying it. Uh, well, but that's what I'm saying. Can you say to somebody, Sometimes, like God, I, but who's what? You, 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 where are you, you? Where are you sourcing your oil from? I can say a couple of things. From our perspective, we buy ninety percent of the oil we have. We are so small that we definitely use licensed collectors because we can't hide. I mean, if you come into our place and the CDFA comes and looks at our records, we're not moving enough that they will not automatically see that we have a problem. You get what I'm saying? Um, but there are larger aggregators, and I do suspect that downstream they're buying oil. Well, some of the oil is winding up with legitimate haulers. They're unknowingly believing that they have a new source of oil that they can buy. Here's a problem that is the same type of problem, but recently the theft of copper, everybody knows about that. Right. See, when now copper all these companies who recycle copper they had to buy these systems now they, they fingerprint 
they get your photo ID, they take a picture of the copper on the scale. So there's a, a line of credibility or you, you have, can trace, like they talk about tracing your oil and things like that. So uh, with your association, you're working with the D, are there laws or suggestions to them on how to get credibility from companies so that way they can make proof of, when you make a contract with a, a business, correct me if I'm wrong, there's a contract based upon a certain amount of oil to be pumped. I would imagine. Like, do they have well, a usage whatever oil they, Whatever oil they put in there. Do they register with you? Like they say, well, we can give you 50 gallons a week. No. Nope. And those types of things are where you, you, you expect a certain amount. So are there any suggestions that you guys are thinking about? I mean, I know there's obviously the talk about it, but well, just curious. On our, our plan is to get the enforcement agencies to follow up on the laws that are there. It, um, I, my background is engineer, and I, I'm, I'm coming from the, 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 uh, the telecommunication companies. When I was an engineer with, the, with Verizon, who was Dell Atlantic and New York Dell before, and I'm not from New York. One of the biggest problems we used to have is junkies would go out and they see these couple of wires and they, and, they, and they just chop a piece off. Now this thing is almost pure copper apart from the insulation and the, that's there. And they get premium dollars for it. And the only way you could solve the problem, when they actually cut a line that had a 911 fiber bone joint cut off two hospitals and about 15 police stations. That was with copper wire. Now the DA get went and realized how oh, they we have been complaining about this. So we have a system there, we just as a um, gentleman just said. If the police go inside and they do spot check regularly of all of these copper wires, if, if they go inside and see a piece of telephone wire, you want to change it. Let me let me explain a little bit more about what what the current laws are, and then I'll open up for some questions on that because some of them may be answered with what I've got to say on this. Um, the haulers have got to be registered with the California Department of Food and Agriculture right now, and they're supposed to. They're required by law to document where they pick it up, where they take it to, and as a licensed transporter, you have to deliver that product that day when you pick it up or hold it until your truck gets full, but you can't transfer it into other containers. It's just the collection license. And uh, the next one would be a collection center license where the licensed hauler would take it to the collection center. And the collection center is required by law to verify that the hauler is registered and that he's legal, he's got, he's current, which I'm petitioning the state to keep a current list every day because cop haulers can fall off the list frequently and come back on. So part of the process is to make sure that the haulers are registered and that they're properly licensed. Uh, so that brings to the waste tracking. Well, actually, there's one more step. Then the render. The collection center can then, they can co-mingle the waste. So the first step to finding the hot loads, as I call the black market, is to get the collection centers to follow through with the waste tracking procedures, which is a law that most people don't even know about. It's required. They know where the waste came from, uh, including the locations of the restaurants that have authorization. And the restaurants, have the contract with the haulers, and that's the only one <coughs> that can haul that waste. You can't give it away. The restaurant owner has a contract with the, the hauler. He can't give it to anybody else. It's by law then becomes the hauler's product. So the first part of the tracking would be to verify that there is a contract, number one, with the legal hauler that's registered. And uh, the restaurant has got to do a little more participation, which is make sure that if they see somebody out there pumping, if the company name is not on the side of the door that matches the hauler's containers, because the containers have to be labeled as well. That's the first step to 
educate the customers, the restaurants, educate the police department on that first step that's looking for hollers that are not legitimate. So far, it's been fairly easy to show the district attorney's office that without the IKG sticker in the window, which is required, you cannot move one ounce waste vegetable well without that sticker in the windshield. It is so critical that you can't even say you have the process of, for application for that sticker and go deliver a drum or pick up a drum. You're breaking the law at that point. And that's what we're teaching the enforcement agencies that the obvious sign, there's no sticker in a windshield, no company logos on the doors. So uh, there is some waste tracking legislation uh, that I'm going to Sacramento actually tomorrow to comment on that's going to hopefully close that loop. That is, it, it's already in place, but the waste tracking that's coming will be licensed hauler. He's got to show his contract and the signature of the owner, not just the dishwasher, not, I mean, not anybody can sign it. The owner's got to sign that he's authorized that hauler to pick it up. And then he'll take his waste tracking manifest to the collection center. The collection center will have to sign off on it. So that the chain of where it came from, where it's going, is on its way. It's already a law that tracking is there, but this is going to be an official document that's got waste tracking numbers, it's got sequential numbers issued by the state to verify that it is going to the proper locations. Uh, <clears throat> So that's in the works right now. But the, uh, the collection centers have got to be more vigilant on who they take it from. They've got to see some documentation that the, the tracking invoice shows that how many gallons was picked up, and so forth and so on. And, and with that, the grease trap cleaning, I know that most of you probably aren't interested in that, but what, what's happening is the grease trap industry is going without regulation, which is causing an environmental impact. That product is not a commodity that can be sold readily. I'm, I'm surprised when I see biodiesel haulers new into the business call me and say, who can I sell my grease trap waste to? Well, there's not a big market for that. It's very highly specialized. So the, uh, the transporter that's not aware or the new, new transporter is going to wind up putting it somewhere. Who knows where? That, that's, to me, the most important part of the waste tracking is keeping a handle on that because the, bar, the environmental impact that's happening from that material just disappearing. It's just gone. Where does it go? I suspect into the sewers and to the next customer's grease trap and so forth and so on. So uh, that, that part of it is coming and I'm glad to see I've waited many years for that type of enforcement. It's through the waste tracking. And, and I'm through the association that I've created, which I encourage all of you to work with, your local haulers, is just call them up and say, hey, I, I lost some account. Do you, anything showing up over at your place? Anything that's new, undocumented, a suspicious hauler? Well, call the district attorney's office or call your local police agent. And say something funny about this because they are getting more active. Haulers, collection centers, and renderers are losing too much money to not say something about it. And when I first started this, there was no police reports. There was nobody reporting it. It was too much of a problem. If you call the police, I'm not going to respond to worry about stolen grease. Come on. I got murderers and meth labs to break up. As well, it's becoming serious business now. Like I've heard some people say, they'll send out a scout to go out and cut the locks off first. Well, and then they'll follow up with a truck and pump it later. Or they'll spill some. And the, and the restaurant owner says, hey, your truck, they'll call the legitimate hauler, has a contract, say, why did you leave that mess in my front door? The hauler wasn't even there. It was one of the fly-by-night companies that have been encouraged through uh, 
lack of enforcement. So that's something that we all need to do to work together. Uh, do you have a question on that? Um, yeah, if the, if the restaurant owner feels that his contract isn't being honored, what's his incentive? If he feels, I'm, I'm, I'm forced by law to sign a contract and somebody goes steals, why aren't I protected? Because I'm being damaged. I'm not sure I understand. You're, 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 um, I mean, if the guy's complaining that, you're, that somebody dumped grease all over his property, and he's had, and it's costing him to pay somebody to clean it up, and you know it's, it's causing a problem for him. But he's, by law, required to have a contract with somebody. A legitimate law. A legit, a, a leg, yeah. The, yeah. And then he calls the. What's where's? What's his incentive? If there's no uh, uh, enforcement on his end. I mean, well, his contract isn't being honored. It's it's not if it's being stolen. Uh, and, right. and, and so the legitimate hauler has taken the criticism for leaving a mess. They, they suspect that it's him there. So his incentive, the restaurant owner, to, to work with his hauler is to let the legit, illegitimate haulers know that somebody's watching them. Right now, nobody's been watching them. So if they do have somebody watching them, the incentive to him is to have a safe collection service and a good communication with his hauler. So there hasn't been that in the past where they, they just figured it was a waste to just get rid of it, it's no big deal. Somebody's taken it away. Because the restaurant owner is not, his priority is not the, the waste oil and the grease trap. He wants to make hamburgers. He, he doesn't... And he doesn't want to be your cop. He, yeah, he doesn't want to be your cop. And he doesn't see the importance to it, but it's affecting him as well. You mind? I just to think about what he was saying, like he's saying that is there an incentive for the restaurant? Or you as a, as a business fan and some other people, they're paying for some of the oil. Yeah. So when you sign a contract, you, you're you not going to pay them for the oil that they had stolen. Right. So then really, if there is no, I mean, the incentive for them is to be educated on it. The restaurant owner, I mean, they're losing money. Yes. They may, they may be concerned about hamburgers, but at the same time, I mean, if, if you can't collect the product, they're not going to get paid. You there, know, so there's got to be some incentive there, I would imagine. Well, the incentive for the restaurant owner is to make sure that the waste that he is generating is being properly disposed of. Because he is ultimately responsible for his waste product. He can't just generate a waste and just give it, let it go down the drain. Mm -hmm. He's accountable for where it goes. So that's part of the incentive, is that he, when he's inspected by the city, uh, FEWD inspectors, which is the the only inspectors right now that inspect the restaurants, he's got to show documentation that his product was at, was was handled correctly mm -hmm. and disposed of correctly. So signature sign off of the product is critical. And that's where the waste tracking manifests are going to be a. Uh, a good tool for the restaurant owner and a good incentive for the restaurant owner to participate with his hauler so that if he sees it being stolen where is it going uh, because some of the product is you know it gets a lot of water in it, it and the collection centers and the renters don't want it so where does it go after that who 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 regulates that who who watches it so us as an industry we need to be proactive with educating our enforcement and restaurant owners that they can't just give away that liability. You generate a waste, it doesn't matter where you are, what industry you're in, if you generate a waste, you're responsible for its proper and legal disposal. So uh, <clears throat> that's where it comes down to the, the association being important is that we open the door to talk to each other. You allow, like if you're starting a new collection business, you just don't want to go in and drop your drum and pick up their drum. It's against the law to transport anybody else's drum. They're, and that part of the enforcement is really being cracked down right now. Uh, Bonnie DeMonis, our local district attorney, went on television and said she's going to dedicate resources to put a stop to that. And so you have to have 
you cannot transport it. You have to have a back truck, basically. You gotta be able to suck it out of a container that's permanently placed in their location. That is the best method. You see some people with totes and, and cheap pumps. That truck tips over or gets into an accident. That stuff spills down the storm drain. Your $2 million liability uh, insurance that's required is gonna be gone right away. It'll be eaten up immediately if it makes it to the storm drain. Um, I know at a large company just recently had a driver leave a valve open on one of his trucks. Drove through all through town, dropping his load. Uh, the cleanup on that is going to be astronomical. And if they, if it had been raining, it would have wound up into the ocean. So, uh, where am I at with this? I'm not sure. Okay. Keep going, I'll fall. All right. So uh, these laws are in place right now. They're they're not being enforced like they should be. Uh, to recap, number one, you got to be a licensed transporter to haul it, meaning that you can't apply for the permit and then go out and start work. Got to actually have your decals. Got to post your insurance or your security bond, um, and have the proper equipment, which I recommend tank trucks. The, the totes are just too easy. Just an accident waiting to happen. Get your contract with your restaurant owner. Inform whoever is there now because every restaurant has has probably a current contract right now. Is pick up the phone, call the old supplier and say, I'm the new contract holder, please pick up your drum. And it's going to be required that you give them two written notices in 14 days. That's, that's coming up. You can't just tape a notice to a drum and say, pick up your drum, I'm putting on the new contract provider. That's that has got to stop. That's bad business practice, and especially like if you put your container up, and the next guy comes along, tapes a notice, or and you don't service it, but once a month, your drum is gone by the time you come back out there. So um, that's going to be important uh, to keep track of. Is, is is open up the communication with the haulers if they're out there now, and work with them. So uh, I have a list of laws here on our website. I encourage you guys to uh, to check them out before uh, you get started in it. Learn what the terminologies are. And basically, uh, that's going to conclude what I have to talk about. These are some of the laws. Like I said, I'll give you a business card on my website. Um, so did I answer your question on whoever asked them today? They get them answered. I, I'm not a professional speaker. I'm just made a long call. Seriously. <laughs> yeah. You got a question? So, so you started your business you're saying first step is to become a licensed hauler. Would you do that? I wasn't I was trying to follow your slides. <laughs> what? Do you need to be a licensed hauler? You want me to go back to that one? What you need to be a licensed hauler is first the proper equipment. Wait. Uh, okay, I, proper equipment. The tanker truck with a vacuum hose and leak-proof valves. You'll have to show a picture of that to uh, the CDFA. You've got to have a license. Your driver has got to be licensed with the CDFA also now. Is that so a CDL license? His, his driver's license has to be valid, and you've got to show that to California Department of Food and Agriculture. Not anybody can just drive a truck to go collect it. It's gotta be, he's gotta be registered with the state. That's, that's a law that a lot of people are overlooking. If you dismiss, dismiss that driver, you've gotta let them know. So, vacuum truck, your IKG sticker, which we probably have a, a you get that from who? You get that from That's Department from the California Food. Department of Food and Agriculture. Does it have to have a CDL? Uh, only if it's over a thousand gallon tank. If you have a thousand. Gallon. Gallon. It's it's actually a thousand gallons. Oh. I just researched. It okay. used to be six hundred gallons. Now it's a thousand gallons. If you're over a thousand gallons, you have to have a tanker endorsement. Mm. That see, that would seem that if they went from six uh, six hundred to a thousand. They became more lenient. They did. I guess that it makes it easier to steal it too from somebody who's not legitimate, so they can carry more. <laughs> yeah. I think. Yeah. 
Uh, also, uh, waste vegetable oil and grease trap waste are two different items. You can't use the same truck. The waste vegetable oil truck can only be used for oil. You can't use it for grease traps, can't use it for anything else because it contaminates the yellow grease, which is the waste vegetable oil. So it has to have a specific truck that just does that or else it could be contaminated. It gets a lot of contaminate yellow grease. What if it had a second tank on it? I, you would have to prove that to like the it was completely separate from the It would have to have separate pumps, separate hoses, mm -hmm. separate dump, uh, all of that. that it, would be, it would be pretty tough. So are there aggregators that are accepting contaminated yellow grease? Or what do you do with it? Yes, there is. Collection centers, renderers will collect it, but they'll charge you for it uh, because there's not enough value in the grease trap waste. If, if that's what your question was, well, or the contaminated yellow grease, if it so gets contaminated. So the incentive for the thief is to steal something, mix it, and then he can't do anything with it. Got to pay to dispose of it. You'll have to take it to a renderer or a company so, that's licensed so, as so a renderer. They're, they're they're stealing to lose money. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, not stealing. Yeah, they're, they're, they're stealing the legitimate hauler's money, number one, because he charges to well, do grease trap waste. It could be as much yeah. as 23 cents a gallon. But a lot of them don't know, and they're like, oh, there's grease in there too. There's grease oh, in there too, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's part of the education process that we're trying to come up with a good, easy method to train people. Um, what else to become a hauler? Yeah. Is it difficult to get this license? Uh, it is becoming difficult. You've got you got to show proof that your driver is registered. You got to show proof that you have a truck that is capable of hauling the oil. The days of the tote in the back of the pickup, I think, are limited. I think that's going to be something that's not going to be proved. You've created a barrier for entry, creating a monopolistic system. The barrier to entry for biodiesel. Well, it's, I, I hate to say barrier of entry because it's free enterprise. Everybody should be able to do as long as they know the laws and comply with them. Well, I think to help out with him, you go to the to Todd's plant, and visually you can see the environmental impact totes can have. They're just disgusting. They're messy. They leak. So why would you encourage somebody to put that in their truck when the causes of a leak? are higher than having a tank truck. Personally, I think that a tank truck is safer for the oh, general yeah. public and for the environment in general. If we're going green with the product, we want to do as much as we can around it, right? Going green? Uh, Supposedly, that's just a, so to speak. Well, I've seen some of those containers out there now. Pardon me? Some of the containers outside these restaurants aren't too green. <laughs> no, they're not. No, uh, that, that's something that Right now uh, is the accepted format. I know that they're going to try to push to have inside containers someday, but I don't know of any restaurant that wants a you waste of oil container inside of his well, restaurant. Well, I can't restaurant. think of any health department that wants them to store yeah. waste in, inside. Yeah. Well, actually, again, I'm from Canada, and we're seeing more and more restaurants, the A&Ws and the burger places, where they actually have the grease traps inside, the tank is in there, there's one pipe coming up where you just hook, drive your truck up and you just hook up the thing to the back end of the pipe and you just suck it all up. That's hard to steal. That, yeah. That's where an illegitimate hauler would have to represent himself as the contract holder. Um, Go inside, open the valve. Yep, yeah, exactly. Wow. Which has happened. We've had we've had people representing themselves as uh, legitimate haulers, going in with business cards and saying, I'm with these guys. Mm -hmm. Well, you just tell the guy to come, hey, open up that valve for me. Here's 20 bucks. Yeah. 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 Well, well, that's where the collection centers need to be more vigilant. They, and the collection centers and the renderers need to have a relationship with the haulers so that we can put a stop to the theft. Because it, it's it's really going to put, I mean, if you're just starting out, it could kill you to go set your route to go collect what you think is going to be a thousand gallons of oil. And the illegitimate hauler has gotten there the day before, you got nothing. So you just wasted your time with the fuel. Uh, it's just counterproductive. Mm -hmm. So going green is uh, if we don't all stick together and become more vigilant in how it's collected and talk about it with our local authorities, make the police aware, the district attorney, which what we've done, 
district attorney involved and explain to them that, yeah, it's only a $200 crime if they break into one, but if their route has got 10 of them on it, you're talking $1,000 worth of that, which becomes... Uh, no, well, see, $1,000 is just the, the oil, but see, when you go out, you amplify that money that you could have sold that oil for, plus your lost time and fuel, so it's amplified. And when they cut locks and break equipment, then you have to replace that also. Yeah, it's if they break equipment or they make a mess, your customer is upset. Um, you have to go clean it up. The after. California Department of Food and Ag has a website where they actually show a collection, an illegal collector backing and in, going and stealing the oil and then backing over the, the restaurant owner's fence and knocking it down. <laughs> so the next morning, that restaurant owner, I'm sure, called his legitimate hauler and said, why did you run over my fence? Yeah. Get out here and fix it. Uh, that's just a shame that, mm -hmm. that we would get that kind of image. It's, it's really getting bad. Are any of these restaurant owners installing any surveillance type equipment? And I, I know it's not cure all, but maybe they get license plate numbers on these vehicles that are stealing the stuff? Some of them are. And some of the restaurant owners that I've had for customers for years are, are complaining about how many solicitations they get each day. <laughs> 10 to 12 solicitors a day could come through their door. It's becoming Ask hilarious. For <laughs> yeah. Asking for their oil, which, you know, I can't blame a guy for wanting to get a new customer, but <clears throat> one right after another wow. coming through. Different people. Different people, different companies. Uh, some legitimate, some not. Most wanted. Most wanted. Oh, uh, it's becoming so, somebody mentioned the copper thefts that this is the next copper theft, is what, what it amounts to. And it, on San Diego's Most Wanted, it's like America's Most Wanted, did an article on it, that aired a, a topic last week. And yesterday. yesterday, they actually interviewed me and uh, some other companies in San Diego. So it's on San Diego's Most Wanted. <laughs> they realize that it's the next copper deal and they've got to put a, put a stop to it. So we do have some advantage there. I, I think about that all the time. Like we, we, our plant, we've had people break in and steal the extension cords and cut them off expensive pumps. We'll leave the pump, but take just the cord. There must be one, two pumps in the copper there, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Breaking, maybe. Breaking into a compound. Take this. It's, it's ridiculous, but it's because of the news. There's all this stuff about copper theft. Copper theft. So it's, it's creating this gold rush mentality. So God help us if that happens with the oil, right? It, it keeps on going out there. Oil theft, oil theft. Attention to it, make people think it's valuable, and then everyone's rush in, so Yeah, that's already there, though. How much they, it's just, and, 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 and that is that's been created by lack of um, following the laws that are on the boats. Uh, the collection centers, and that they want to get their product, they're going to take it. Only one enforcement officer? And there's only one enforcement officer for the state of Cal Southern California right now. And part of that it's going to have to be stepped up, and I know it's going to cost us more, but it's going to have to be stepped up. You had a question? So what's the licensing requirement for a collection center? A collection center, it's, uh, well, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of license. Number one, you got to go to California Department of Food and Agriculture. That's number one. Show them your diagram of your facility, what you plan to do. There's some local uh, building ordinances that have to be followed. So you uh, zoning laws uh, require special permits, building codes, health permit, you would have to apply to the local building zone and tell them what you're gonna do, because not every area is gonna allow a collection center. It's like having- yeah, but the licensing is with the Department of Food and Licensing Department Food of Agriculture. The so I called before trying to who do you start with being a from? No one knows. DMV. And that's a good question, and that might be part of what's going on is lack of communication with education from that department. Because let me tell you what I had to do when I built my plant back in 1993. I had to go to the county, <clears throat> apply for a permit to build the facility, number one. Um, and I couldn't just build it anywhere. I had to have high commercial property. Uh, the highest commercial rating in San Diego was the property that I had to have to build my plant. 
So that was my first hurdle that I went through. They needed uh, plans submitted showing how I was going to contain all of the liquids, how I, what type of tanks were going to be used. You can't just use any kind of tank. It's got to be set in the foundation. It requires permitting. So next step after county. County, building zone, which those would be the same, the health department, Department of Health Services, and then submit your plans uh, to CDFA. Uh, and there's even more requirements for rendering facility. Uh, there again, you gotta go through the California Department of Food and Agriculture, uh, local uh, planning and zoning, insurance so first step planning zone to make sure that your facility would be in a location that you could run a collection center in order to have a back truck and to process that yourself you have to have both licenses huh? you have to have that that's a good question yeah what's the difference between a collection center and a renderer uh, a collection center you cannot treat the material you can't turn it into a product oh. At that point, collection yeah, center. Three. Yeah, <laughs> collection center is just a collection center, and that does not automatically allow you to transport. You need a transporter, collection center, or renderer's license. So you can have renderer, collection center, but you also have to have a transporter's license. Okay. So those minimum of two, and you know, they'll charge you fees for both of those. So um, four state. <laughs> yeah, that was a good question. Yeah, because it, uh, uh, I was going to touch on that. If you um, process it for your personal consumption, then you're, you you have a business that you're you're vacuuming companies to process that material personally. Are the laws the same? You still yes. So, it better. I have to say something. I have two licenses. So we've got Grease Masters, our sister company, which is our hauler, and we have Promethean, which is the plant we were in. And we pay for two licenses. Right. So that was one of the questions they just came up yeah, with. Was so it? Uh, we do that. Yeah. You, you, just because you have a renter's license or collection mm -hmm. license doesn't mean you can Transport. run a truck for transportation part. Uh, personal use. As personal use. Uh, surprisingly, it's against the law. What? For you as an individual to go collect or go behind a restaurant and take some of that oil home and experiment with it. Not allowed. Really. You have to be registered for personal use. You can only use up to 165 gallons. You have to follow the same uh, transportation compliance um, laws um, and the waste tracking, where you picked it up. You have to have the owner's signature that he's giving you permission to take it. Uh, that, that's another one that's a big surprise to most people. That you but can't haul one. No minimum threshold. No, at least $300 a year. I think you don't have anything. It's 165 gallons at one time and no more than that. And you can't sell it, you can't trade it, you can't give it away. But it's it got to be just for your personal use. But you still have to be licensed. How much do oh. you store in your house? I think 165 gallons is maximum at any one time. Maybe the counties are different. I don't know. You think uh, I think it's the state thing. That's state law. Yeah. State yeah. law says. State law, Three hundred dollars a year, and that's it. Because you can't operate a collection center in your house. You have got twenty acres of land in the back, which I know that they're what you have, but you're not supposed to do that. Three hundred dollars, and what do you mean, like processing costs? No, you can see that three hundred dollars a year. You, you still pay oh. the enforcement fee. What? Oh. What's different about our industry here in California is, you know, just talks a lot about how the enforcement really lacks. We pay up front for the enforcement. Most of our registrations, I think, I pay three thousand one hundred dollars a year. One hundred dollars is the registration for the plan. Three thousand dollars is the enforcement fee. <laughs> paying the guy to come out and audit me <laughs> and audit the other plants to keep us all honest. <laughs> so we're paying the system. It really doesn't quite work. So what you're saying <laughs> yeah. is you can buy yourself or assemble yourself a Johnny Appleseed processor, but as soon as you try to put anything in it to process, you're breaking the law. Unless you're lying. Virgin oil, yes. Not with WBO. It was not. It was non-virgin oil. It was not regulated under any of these programs. 
spread. Oh, yeah. Okay. So we're not buying your oil. Yeah, this is waste vegetable. <laughs> yeah, not, not, yeah, not, not for not 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 Costco, you're breaking the law. But That's you know, a lot of these local home brewers are, are doing this. So but but you know, so almost you know every this. home. And then where are they putting their waste byproducts? Where's that going? Gets waste vegetable oil from the local Japanese restaurant. And that's against the law. Another reason to look Up to 160. Um, no. This is just California. Oh, this is just California. Oh, up to that oh. point. But you can't <laughs> transport it. Let me see if I've covered <laughs> what, I've, what I've got here. You can't transfer zero <laughs> gallons. So you can't get it to your house without having that. Without having I have these laws all on my uh, website. If you guys want to take a card and, and send me a comment, or if there's something that's not covered on there. I'd be more than happy to look it up for you or put you in contact with whoever you need to be with uh, for that because I, I really encourage uh, following the law because it's going to be not too far away to where everything is going to be strict. As so on the, on the production side, how much can you store? Pardon me? On production, what's the limits and if you have a license or without mm -hmm. a license? With a license. With a license, I, I don't. What's I don't the think there is a cap. What's that the means. amount you can keep on your facility with a production license? Well, there, there isn't, uh, though they do uh, look at your facility and make sure that it meets all the local and, and their regulatory requirements. And, uh, and then that would be the local city's permitting requirements because it is a class 3B material mm -hmm. after that. So then you're looking at fire. And other kinds of issues. Even though the class, you, know, you don't think this stuff is done because you can throw matches on it all day. The reality is, under the BART state code, uh, it's covered under the National Fire Protection. That's true. I uh, forgot to so add that. That's what happens after that. You'll have to have the fire marshal come out and approve your tanks. Well, because we're getting into the business just to supply our own trucks, and that's going to be it's expensive for us. I mean, it's a million dollar a year for our diesel consumption. So. You know, we need to be able to offset that. So, for us to do that, we're going to have to go through and buy and be a certified rendering facility to produce our own fuel. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, but you, you actually you've got you've got the whole gamut. Code. So you've got what CFA is saying about what the collection side is. Then you'll have uh, state, local, municipal fire, mm -hmm. um, and you'll have just the, the tire. You're doing the entire thing, so you're going to have to worry about it. It's all everything. Okay, yeah. I saw it. And then how also, you'd have to register your pickup trucks, remember? So there's a limit on the trucks. That, that registration you have mentioned is only for a number of trucks. It's one truck, $100. Oh. Yeah, that's right. Every truck has got to have an IKG sticker, whether it's delivering a drum, picking up a drum. Um, what about running um, the biodiesel? I don't, there's no permit. No, no, you have to register with CFA. CFA has another program, it's a different department. So it's mm -hmm. Weights and Measures, which controls the actual production of biodiesel. You're using the high blend concentrations that are different than what an ASTM has standard for, mm -hmm. you know, the conditional use of a variance of labor. Yeah. And you also needs to register with the IRS. That's IRS, say the IRS. Yeah. Fuel. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to respect fuel, register with the EPA. What you've done is you've actually created what you really need to have a, a spec plan. Yeah, if you're going to do it, it's cost wise, you, you know, you, companies have to do that if they want. I mean, when you use that much, you have to think about. Uh, well, I, I mean, I understand what you're saying. So yeah. the, I mean, if that's the, if the whole thing, you have to do all that, and so be it. But you know, they regulate, I mean, if you have a trucking company, you know, there's so much insurances and taxes and licensing. It's just endless, it seems yeah. like. You got to pay road taxes. Well, so if you get caught moving the fuel, cause they come and they'll test the fuel. Like, they, they actually come to my neighbor because they know where fuel crash is. They want to make sure that I'm not giving my neighbor fuel. So the IRS visits me about four times a year. Wow. Okay. Lucky you. Yeah, mm -hmm. lucky me. So they actually come and also test. They take fuel out of the. So we got they've got a diesel forklift. We want to make sure that uh, uh, we haven't given them the red dye or something that that's, that we're claiming under the oil. Oh, so that you have a charge of road tax. Yeah. So that's a whole different regulatory. Yeah, I was looking at that for a second. <laughs> well, I hope I didn't raise more questions than I did the answer questions, but if yeah. I did, not helpful. Uh, uh, can we give you any information? The name of our website is sdfogha.org. So it's San Diego Fats, Oils, Greases, Haulers Association. Were our questions helpful to you? Yes. Everybody's questions are helpful. 
it put, brings us together talking about it and helping to uh, combat a common problem for all of us. Yeah, because I'm, I'm outside, uh, outside your aspect of business. I'm a biodiesel uh, uh, distributor. Oh. And uh, Good. so I'm at the other end of the chain. And so when I, so it's always surprising to me when I, when I look at the complexity uh, of, of the process that there that there's somebody who thinks that can, you know, absolute free enterprise is the mafia. So the question is, <laughs> you know, so the question is that without regulation, where are the crooks in the business making their money? Mm -hmm. So it's always amazing to me that there's somebody uh, in that the non-enforced. That's where I'm pushing for more enforcement, period. I'm, I'm bringing it to the attention of all agencies that should have the right to inspect records, um, follow up. If something sounds too good to be true, I'm always suspicious. And I have to say something here. This is a real problem. Because, uh, because we're sort of in Temecula, which is a little bit off the beach path for most of these folks, we tend to pay the highest prices in our local markets. We beat LA, we beat San Diego local markets for what we don't get for them. So that means that a lot of what's going on is not licensed. San Diego is just an hour south of here. All that debt you do is just going to put my door. They're not. So it's interesting to me because there, I'm hoping that the increased regulation will actually help drive more traffic to my operation. I, I hope it will. I'm hoping that they shut down the ones that are buying the hot oil. It just. I want to see some of them. If, if we know who they are, please contact a local district attorney and they are actively pursuing that type of crime now. Because the scuttlebutt, we always heard, you know, the sort of the folkloric stuff was, well, we're so close to the border that it's an international theft that it's going out of country. Some of it is. It's going on to boats because it's, you know, nobody's regulating it going out of country. That's where the waste tracking is going to be the most important. It's going to be... If they enforce it, which I'm not going to leave them alone until they do, I'm going to be tugging at somebody's ear all the time until they finally follow where it comes from, how it's treated, and where it ends up. It's just, it's, it's got to be. There's no way that you can compete with the illegal haulers. It's just. I want to thank Dan very much for. Thank you. I appreciate you guys.